Thank you for the introduction. I really want to thank the organizers for including us, including myself and my collaborator and research and partner, Dr. Avalin Espinosa. We were here last year actually joining AFA and we did a presentation then. How many of you were uh, in number last year? So a few of you. It's good. I will show you some information that I used last year, but the purpose is to illustrate new topics. Actually, I was inspired by the previous talk. To me, it was very significant. It reminded me of a time in high school when one of the professors wanted to promote, one of the teachers wanted to promote his area of expertise, and he said, if you want to understand nature superficially, then you would look at biology. I'm a biologist. <laughs> if you want to understand nature more deeply, you would go into chemistry. And if you really want to understand nature at the ultimate level, then you will go into physics. <laughs> and it is really true. Except mention, uh, we host this evolutionary trusted website. We ask you to visit it. We post there lots of information about what we do, and especially articles that are available to everyone. One should be coming out very soon in a couple of days, I guess. A new one. This one is from the Galapagos Evolution Summit, where we presented part of the work and presenting today, but in reality, most of it is very, very new, branch new for you. There are quite a few uh, articles that came out in, in the newspapers and also in quite a few magazines and uh, you can look at them. We have a book coming out at the end of the year and uh, with new essays about evolution and evolution literacy. So quite a few of them will be there. New material will show up and we'll let you know via the website. You can also follow us on Twitter. On Twitter. So indeed, I grew up in a family where everybody writes about something. It could be history, it could be medicine, it could be biology, it could be literature. And in my case, I'm the one who writes about biology, and particularly about evolution. I went to the Galapagos when I was in high school, and that's what made me a biologist. And because I grew up in Ecuador, and now Evelyn and I go to the Galapagos or to Hawaii every other year, and we overlap since we are developing courses for our students in a comparative fashion, the Galapagos Archipelagos versus Hawaii. Um, but that's really an excuse the ideas to go to the islands every year. So that's what we're doing. A year ago, we posted this uh, survey for the atheists. We did it through AAA. And what we did was to ask questions about science, about evolution, and about, of course, religiosity among atheists. And uh, we were able to course posted on the website, we had lots of data comparing atheists with several other groups, and probably you're going to see that today a little bit, although I will not cover again the material I covered last year. But what is interesting is that when we published this in Secular World, we made it available as a PDF in our websites, and among all of our scientific publications in all of our areas, none of them have had the significance of this one. And we were checking this morning with Avelina, and this one has had more than 400 downloads all over the world. And it's a tiny little article that came out in Secular World. We wish any other of our articles in science would have been downloaded this way. But this is the one. So you can visit and download this one as well. Recently, we published for the first time uh, in a book about religion, we publish a chapter. So I'm very happy and excited about this. You can see there, you see the hands, you see uh, the candles. So it's a, but it's a very scholarly book. It has lots of chapters about uh, the scholarly work in uh, religiosity. But we published this chapter, The Everlasting Conflict, Evolution, Science versus Religiosity. And in this one, we introduce the topic that I'm going to talk about today, although in this chapter we didn't address it in depth as much as I'm going to do it today. The incompatibility hypothesis. And this hypothesis, what it does 
is to explain the controversy over evolution versus creationism. And we think that this controversy relies and is intrinsic to the incompatibility between scientific rationalism and empiricism versus the belief in supernatural causation. I will explain why this is a hypothesis and why we are testing it. We do know, and all of our studies suggest, that acceptance of evolution is correlated heavily with education. Educational attainment is one of the most significant factors that determines acceptance of evolution. But of course, not only education, you have to be literate in science, and you have to know something about evolution. At the same time, all of our studies and others identify the disruptive role, the cultural pollutants that religiosity and conservative ideology can have on the acceptance of evolution and of evidence. So we do think that belief causes three damages. We call it the DDS. Belief disrupts, delays, and stops the correct comprehension and acceptance of evidence. And this is what causes the controversy. Now, the hypothesis is a tentative explanation about a natural phenomena. I'm a faculty member, remember, so I'm going to have to be a little bit professorial. I know that the word professorial has turned into an insult, which I take it, but in a couple of days I'm going to be lecturing to a group of 200 students and freshmen, so this is a practice for me for Wednesday. So I'm going to have to be a little bit scholarly in what I say. We have this observation in nature, and nature is society. We see a controversy of people seeing evidence in different ways, or not even paying attention to evidence. And the question is, what elicits, what generates a controversy between science, evolution, and supernatural causation? And the incompatibility hypothesis suggests that they are intrinsically incompatible. And we have to offer, of course, an explanation for that, is that the approach that science follows is completely different than the approach that belief follows. In both we have rationalism, but empirical and scientific rationalism and empiricism differs from the way we approach belief. We do think that there are quite a few testable predictions of this incompatibility hypothesis. We have decided to address only three. And you'll see the connection of them with topics that have been discussed today and also yesterday. One is what we call the historical prediction. What we predict here is to have a chronological conflict between science evolution and religion. And also we predict to have accommodation over time. Religion accommodates to the new discoveries in science. And we predict this to happen historically and this can be analyzed and tested that way. The information prediction, which is the literacy prediction, what suggests is that change in evolution's acceptance should be affected by educational attainment. And I will show you some data about this. And we have what we call the conflict and or the conflict resolution prediction. And this one, what it does is to explain the change in evolution's acceptance as functions of, for example, you see there, level of religiosity, level of skepticism, and of course, level of secularism, secularism, let's say. So I would like to address a little bit about each one of those topics. The historical prediction, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but I will show some examples that will become obvious to you. Going from whatever shape the earth was to accepting that it's the sphere, going from geocentrism, of course, here is in prison, going from the idea of immutability of a species to Darwin's concept of common descent. In all those cases, we have a historical change of evidence that is added into our understanding of reality. And at the same time, we have a constant accommodation by religion. The creator, the designer, they re-emerge in the background of any new naturalistic explanation of any new discovery. 
which explains, as you see there, the emergence, for example, of basic evolution, creation science, innovation design. This latest one that is coming up, biologists do emerge out of this accommodating, this accommodation tradition of belief. I have to warn you that actually there's an excellent book by Victor Stenger, God with or the folly of faith, and he addresses directly actually this incompatibility between science and religion. And he does this historical account for how they are incompatible and how you can see this in history. We go beyond this, we don't want to be uh, addressing the details of this, but we want to conceptually explore this hypothesis of incompatibility. So I do recommend this book. The information and prediction goes together with this conflict and conflict resolution and prediction. Let me show you something here. It's very easy to see. See here, acceptance of evolution, assumption of education and attainment. And it goes from as low as 21% only in every five people in high school to about close to 100%. It should be 100%, but close to 100% among the professors in New England. So we tested this at 35 colleges and universities here in this area of the country that has the highest levels of acceptance of evolution anywhere in the nation. So this is part of our studies, the rest we are following Gallup data. So you would agree with us that there's a correlation between acceptance of evolution and educational we see this, however, to be prominent at the college level. There's a dramatic transformation of people, of our students, when they go to college. Also, biology majors at public institutions, private and religious institutions. And each one of them, each of those cohorts, increases acceptance of evolution significantly between four years and only. And this also is true at the religious institutions, not as much as my school, of course, since I'm responsible for this, I want to believe that. Uh, but it is the case, all of that ways. There's a traumatic change when the kids are away from their families, independent, alas, not only to drink and party, but also to think under the influence of their professors. Huge transformation. Now, this forces me to show you a slide that probably five people here have seen before. We test this acceptance of evolution as a function of three main factors. One here, you see here, is here's understanding the essence of science, the understanding of how evolution works, and personal religious convictions. And this is a 3D environment, going from no acceptance of evolution, of course, when you have no understanding of anything, and then you increase in different directions. This is a 3D shaped landscape where I'm going to place different peoples. So this is a low awareness corner. We call it a low probability corner, low probability of occurrence, since you would have to be completely unaware of everything to belong to this point here. But you would have the highest level of acceptance of evolution, theoretically, if you have very high levels of understanding of science, deep understanding of evolution as well, and zero religiosity. And that's our prediction. The lowest level of acceptance of evolution would be on the other place, where you have zero or none understanding of science and evolution, and of course you have very high religiosity. And then we place on this interesting corner this area of the highest conflict and the highest conflict that you can see in society as well. However, this would predict that the individual is very knowledgeable about science, very knowledgeable about evolution, but is also very religious. And when the individual is like that, the individual can escape from this position via adopting three approaches. One is to believe that evolution and creation is more in harmony. The other one is to think that they belong to two separate domains, non-overlapping magisteria. And the last one is agnosticism. I'll come back to that in a second. I wanted to place you in this context. 
Always when I show this, people ask to each other, where are you located? Can you guess? So think about this. You belong to somewhere there in this landscape. And the others are just simply LPCs, low probability of occurrence corners. So rare to find that, not impossible. Now let me show you something, and I'll show you some data from the ATS because you want to see yourselves projected there. This is a science index that goes from 0 to 3 for different groups of people. This is evolution index, and this is religiosity index. So look here. First we have the professors of New England. Look at the atheists, so high and close to them. Third, you have here scientists from all over the world particular Europeans, those are educators or prospective teachers here in New England, and those are students. In terms of evolution, again, atheists run very high. And look here, of course, in religiosity, atheists have zero, but all the other groups have some sort of religiosity. And if you think that high school education and beyond gives more acceptance of evolution, then you may be wrong in guessing that here in New England, faculty at the most prestigious universities, you will have zero religiosity, and it's not the case. Actually, when you ask the question to the faculty here in New England, the most elite universities, is religion very important in your life? 30% of them answer yes. And this may be shocking to you. It wasn't to us, actually, that's why we decided to do the study, because we guessed that that wasn't the case. It wasn't our personal experience to see it. So this was shocking for us. And in this graph, what we have is, again, this is the landscape that I showed before. This would be science index, as function of evolution index, and this would be religiosity index. So look here on the top, of course, you have the New England faculty. 94% accept evolution, regardless of others' opinions. And 82% think that evolution is definitely true. On the other side, you have here the students. Next to them, and you should watch this out, are the educators and prospective teachers. And those are educators that have PhDs and doctoral degrees in education. And they have higher levels of religiosity than the students that they teach. And of course, in red are uh, the atheist, and uh, goes to the light that is to the top right, together with the scientist. Those are basic questions. I'm not going to go into the details since all of this can be downloaded from our website. I haven't really explained this before. Now, what we do see is to confirm that belief disrupts, delays, or stops acceptance of evidence. Let me show you this graph, and nobody will think it, oh, class, math, again. No. It's very easy to understand, and I'll explain to you. First here, you have uh, evol evolution. Here you have, let's see, I can't see the graph. Is it science? Yes. So the first one is science. The second one is evolution. And it's a function of religiosity. And in all cases, you have a reduction in acceptance or understanding of science or a reduction in understanding evolution as religiosity increases. And that affects the professors, affects the scientists in Europe and the rest of the world, the educators and prospective teachers and the students. Of course, we have no data for the atheists since religiosity would be zero. But it's interesting about atheists here, look at this line and this low of this line it tends to be almost parallel. Right? So it's the least the least relationship we have between acceptance of science, or understanding of it, and acceptance of evolution. Actually, the atheists do sit them very close to one another, science and evolution go together. That's the way they conceptualize it and understand it. Okay, we think that the incompatibility hypothesis is what we call an ultimate level of analysis why is that? The incompatibility hypothesis actually proposes that supernatural causation is improbable. And because of that, the conflict in society between science evolution and religiosity emerges. Out of the incompatibility, of course, but out of the improbability of 
supernatural possession. And whenever we debate about this, whenever anybody will debate about this in the future, the conflict will re-emerge whenever you have supernatural possession in the analysis. Every ultimate level hypothesis covers other hypotheses underneath. We call them actually the umbrella type of hypothesis. There are studies that, for example, this is the study done in 2006 came out in science, acceptance of evolution in the United States as function of several variables there. So let me show you this. I know that professors do better when they walk, right? Wake up their students. Let me show you this something. So you are born with a given age, zero, with a gender, and you are born this way. This now science helps us to change it whenever you want to. Then you move into having education, education in genetics. Later on in life, you have those traits: religiosity, polite beliefs, science technology, and reservations about science technology. All those red arrows suggests a negative correlation between, in this case, religion and acceptance of evolution. Very interesting and unique in the US is that pro-life beliefs are correlated negatively with acceptance of evolution and political ideology. This is the only country where you have, among the developed countries, that connection. If you look at Europe, the main factor is, of course, religiosity correlated negatively with acceptance of evolution. Pro-life beliefs almost nothing, but no connection between political ideology. The suggestion then is that in the US, you have a direct relationship between belief and conservatism, something that you don't have in Europe in terms of the influence uh, with acceptance of evolution. The Europeans don't make that connection, but Americans do. Other proximate levels of analysis that feed a lot of work right now, there's a lot of publications about this, uh, do include this type of uh, connections between, for example, creationist views, evolutionary misconceptions, etc. So new studies are doing the same thing. This is from one of our colleagues, Patricia Foley, and they published this recently. And what they see is different factors that connect acceptance of evolution with different variables. So we consider them to be very important. All of them are valuable and do illustrate what happens in society. I can go into some details if you want. But just realize that there is heavy research being done on the topic. And of course, secularism is an area of our interest. So what are the alternatives to the incompatibility hypothesis? Every hypothesis should be falsifiable, as you know, and it should have its alternatives. One is harmony. harmony. Harmony between science and evolution and religion. We think that, of course, this is a compatibility in principle and practice hypothesis. We see a problem here, that harmony is always short-lasting. It relies on accommodation, as you can imagine, and the examples we have are basic evolution, creation of science, by a lot of, and all of them are destined to fade away. I want to develop a little bit more on this. As an example, look at Biologos, which is emerging recently. This is from the book The Language of Science and Faith, authored by professionals and scholars in a way, Carl Giberson and Francis Collins. Look at what they say about the, the proposal. They propose a model for divinely guided evolution, which requires no intrusions from the outside for its account of the Creator, except for the origin of the natural laws that guide the process, meaning the Creator is responsible for the natural laws, for the laws of the universe. Once life arose, evolution and natural selection permitted the development of biological diversity, including humans. So in essence, this proposal says that once the creator was known, right, it just was known, and then continue in touch for eternity. We think that if you realize this 
proposal will fade away as well. That's why we have stated, and actually we published this in Secular World, and we indicated that in matters of God's non-existence, the highly or the high school educated atheist is by far more lucid than the deeply religious religious. I'm, I'm sure that you agree with us on this. Perhaps in other areas of science, we may not be as proficient and as educated and as talented as other scholars, but in areas of God's non-existence, we are right. The other alternative is NOMA, which is a compatibility in practice, not in principle, because it suggests that science, evolution, and religion are far away, they should be separated. We have a problem with this because we think that NOMA is compulsory, it actually challenges the freedom to scrutinize each other, and at some point, researchers, biologists, will always look at the possibility of supernaturalization, and they will end up rejecting it. And finally, we have agnosticism as another possibility, and it's compatibility in principle and practice as well. There's a problem is that it offers an uncompromising position, and it differs, and is consistent with the straightforward approach that science has. So it does not rely on accommodation as much as the harmony hypothesis does, and that's why being agnostic is more oh, profitable than moving into the other harmony, as you can imagine. It's more acceptable somehow. It doesn't require the same level of accommodation that um, the harmony hypothesis suggests. So what are the implications then of this hypothesis? is that harmony and coexistence between science and religiosity is illusory. We don't think that that will ever be the case. We think that, that the conflict between science, evolution, and religiosity will continue, will be permanent for as long as supernatural conversation is around. And whenever you see in nature, meaning in society, low levels of antagonism, they are just part of our between high and low levels of antagonism between science and belief and science and righteousness. It's just a matter of time that the antagonism will be happening anyways in society. So there is no harmony and the harmony will not persist. It may be an illusion that we have harmony. So what is the solution to this? And of course the solution is that common knowledge by itself is fed by scientific rationalism and empiricism. And I will follow with what has been said in the previous talks, that common knowledge can be simply part of uh, people knowing what the scientific truth is and just following it, enjoying it, and uh, being fascinated by it. So let me show you some statistics that you would like to see. I'm sure that uh, I'm closing right now because I do want to take your questions and have a discussion, so I'm going to move a little bit fast for this. This is, uh, of course, we are familiar with religiosity here, different groups. This is major religions uh, worldwide, 2010. This is from uh, 2,500 censuses conducted in 230 countries. This is from the Pew Research Center. What I want to point out is look at the unaffiliated there. It is true that they are 16%. It is true that it's an important, uh, the unaffiliated are an important group. However, I do want to you know, want you to be cautious when analyzing these numbers. This is only for the US unaffiliated. Of course, we have been talking about this about 20%. And the data comes from the research form. However, if you break it apart, you realize that within this 20%, most are, you know, nothing in particular. Some of them are atheists, and some of them are agnostic. If you analyze this the way the Pew Research Center does it, so the real numbers for self-defined atheists is only about 6%. And it, when it cautions you a little bit about this, since sometimes we see numbers that make us enthusiastic about it what the standards are, the unaffiliated, when you ask them questions about 
supernatural causation, they are more prone to coincide with questions about supernatural causation. Tend to accept supernatural causation more than diagnostics and of course the atheists. And that's what our research. We actually, Evelyn and I were looking at this numbers last night uh, to verify that what we were going to tell you today was accurate. This is again from, uh, I think this is from Dalu. You have there the top 10 atheist populations. And uh, of course, you want to see this. this the top is China with about half of the population atheist. And then there's a jump to 30% in Japan. And then it goes down to 10 percent So those are the top 10. I think that the US ranks the 25th value. And according to the Pew Research Center, it's with a value I mentioned before, around 6% in atheists. This is for the top 10 most religious populations. And of course, in this case, you're going to have you know, almost zero here, or no response. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of promoting rationalism. And of course science, which is the enormous in the venue right, for uh, rationalism and interest. So look at this one. Um, those are the really positive news, the decline in religiosity. Uh, those are the top countries. Worldwide, there's a 9% decline in religiosity. And those are the top 10 countries where you have decline in religiosity. I'm very excited about Ecuador. You know, I grew up in Ecuador, and I came from there, and it's minus 15% decline. The US is minus 13% decline. So those are encouraging news, but at the same time, keep in mind what I mentioned before, is that the nouns have to be analyzed carefully. Don't claim the nouns for the atheists, because the research doesn't suggest they belong fully there. All of them, perhaps they're open to discuss secularism more than any other. And if you want to plot this for what happens in Congress right now, uh, you have here, uh, those, I think, those are Protestants, those are Catholics in Congress, and uh, among all those seats, that's what I wanted to show you, going back to the unaffiliated one member. And if we apply the idea that I mentioned before, remember that in matters of God's non-existence, the high school educated atheist is more lucid than the deeply religious scientist. Apply that to this, and then you realize that in this, there's only one individual that is right. <laughs> it doesn't improve much for the House of Representatives, but uh, the number is uh, for the Senate. Okay. Is, uh, the House is for the Senate. And uh, is very similar. World religion, of course, decreases as function of education. And to us, education is very important. It is the major factor to face supernatural causation and irrationalism. But also is poverty. And I'm so glad that at this specific meeting of AAA yesterday and today, we have insisted a lot on poverty and the role on accepting belief in supernatural causation. Not to justify it, but I think that it's a cause that is very important to pay attention to. We have here, from low income to high income, the decrease in religiosity. But what I want to tell you, and this is not showing here, is that when you go beyond the level of richness, then the religiosity increases again. And this also happens a lot the world, particularly in the US, and we have the data to show that. So higher income determines less religiosity. Very, very high income increases religiosity. And that's very interesting. This is acceptance of evolution worldwide, but with the condition that God created humans. And that's the way the world accepts evolution. 40% is the average value. Those are the countries with the highest acceptance of evolution. But they do it under the premise that God has created humans. Under the US here. Only about 30% of evolution. 
and this goes up and down depending on the poles. And now let me show you this one that is very interesting to us. This is from 1982 to 2012 by Gallup. Gallup is very good at doing this and gives you polls that ask indirectly related questions or directly related questions and answers to them in different ways. Look here. This would be evolution, meaning humans evolve, but God had no part in the process. And it goes from 9% to 15% nowadays. This is uh, distant creationism. Humans evolve, but God guided the process with God involvement. So it's equivalent to a basic evolution, creation science. Somehow God is present. And the other one is proximate creationism. God created humans in the present. I want to wonder how this changes when you just introduce a word in the poly. This is 2013, a month ago. Look here, evolution. Humans evolved by God did not directly guide the process. And when you introduce that word, there's change in the way people perceive the question and answer to it. And Gallup has demonstrated this, and several other studies have demonstrated that in their own research have demonstrated it. it depends how you word it. Actually, you can extract some supernatural causation belief from audiences that apparently don't have supernatural causation in their menu. So if you're interested in our research articles, we have quite a few we have published this since 2009, I guess. So we have quite a few peer review publications. They are in a different website that's on my last website. You go here, in the Star Movie, you go to publications, you click there, and everything pops up. And everything's available for you. So all those publications are available to you. And Avelina and I make an effort actually to write in such a way that even though this is a scientific paper, others can use it. So we're very clear, our papers are very long. We explain the statistics in a very clear manner we make the information available to everybody. Many of you are in education, or you want to outreach. Those papers, you don't need to know much about statistics. Uh, if you understood my talk today, most likely you will understand all the papers. This one just came out at the beginning of this year. Uh, we run this New England Science Public Initiative, and uh, it's a consortium with institutions in the area and uh, as you can imagine, years ago, people were thinking, what are you doing, New England? Right? This is, you know, we accept evolution. We demonstrated to them that it's not the case, so now we are getting more and more support. If you can go to serious evolution, you can download this study, it has all the data, all the statistics, the executive report, and uh, the summary as well. So we are developing New England Science Public on this particular year, in this area, uh, we're going to be very good. The Boston Globe uh, picked up on this, and it was considered to be you know, one of the interesting studies last year, Standard Times as well. So it has been popping up in the month. Now, at the beginning of June, we went to the Galapagos uh, for the World Evolution Summit, and we shared this uh, part of this information, not this way actually, with scientists. But I wanted to tell you something. It's not easy for scientists to be secular, and it's not easy for scientists to talk to other scientists and be as secular or as atheist as we are. Even though scientists, 70 percent in the U.S. and in places higher, are secular themselves, they do defend with their intelligence, they do defend with their rationalism and their skills the right of others to believe. And we have found ourselves, as researchers actually, to be confronted by scientists themselves. So don't take it for granted that scientists eh, embrace evolution per se, and that they are secular the way eh, some of us are. So this is a magnificent, of course, marine iguana from the Galapagos. And uh, I do photography as well, so enjoy it.
We enjoyed this meeting so much. It was small, only 300 people, and we have an article about this. From all over the world, we had um, uh, 12 keynote addresses right, from people from all over the world. But again, they received a talk really, really well. And uh, it, it goes in cycles. We presented our talk, and everybody was with us, tweeting all over the place. Everybody approached us, everybody was happy. Then they went to dinner and then breakfast and lunch. Now they have the time to talk about it. Like, Savelina and I are not popular anymore. <laughs> the second day things change. So, so we take advantage of the first night. So we try to go out and talk to them. They're really happy, but the second day, uh -uh. And if there are scientists that travel with their spouses, most of us too, the spouses approach us, uh, they approach us, right? And they talk to us directly how wrong we are presenting it this way. It's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon. We are, we've seen this more and more. So um, this is a warning to you to think about this. It's not that for scientists it's easy to be secular. It's, it's not that way. And then a week ago, we were in Portugal, in Lisbon, at the European Society for Evolutionary Biology meetings. And of course, we enjoyed it really well. And uh, this is our last picture, and uh, this is the monument to the discoveries. And we do want to feel this joy that the Europeans felt during the 1400s, the 1500s, the age of discovery, that brought a lot of illumination, but not through the Enlightenment. There were scientists behind, traveling in the world, demonstrating that you could circumnavigate, that you could find new paths to arrive to reality. And uh, this monument exemplifies that. I think that Lisbon is so beautiful. And uh, in comparison to Galapagos, it's difficult to say, of course, Galapagos is in our hearts. But we fell in love with Lisbon and with this meeting deeply. In your coming book, we have a statement. And uh, because I'm not a radio expert, I have asked our colleague and friend to read some of the statements that I'm including in our coming up book. Yes. Shotgun marriages between evolution and faith have never worked, despite the tradition of pointing the barrel at evolution's head. The truth is that evolution likes it single, free, with no stoppers of thought or restraints on logic. When lured unknowingly into the altar by those who see facts and fiction compatible, evolution has consistently stood belief up and walked away, sometimes run toward its secular turf. The dream of arranging evolution's wedding with belief will remain dormant for as long as evolution is awake.